Hey, what's up, folks? It's been a while. Sorry about that. Uh, the apocalypse is a crazy time. I hope you're all doing great. I want to do a quick video on WebAssembly because I've been playing around with it lately, and it's it's pretty cool and is not as hard to get into as I thought it would be. Now, WebAssembly is a binary compilation target. It's uh, not a language. You don't write anything in WebAssembly. You write stuff in a different language, like say Rust or C, and then you compile that to WebAssembly. And it's a binary format that was originally made to run in web browsers. Now the reason, why, there are several reasons why you'd want to do that. Um, it's generally faster as WebAssembly than it is in JavaScript. Uh, there, and, and it just makes sense that it would be. There's uh, JavaScript has to be just in time compiled, and then since it's not strongly typed and for other reasons, it has to go through a whole bunch of optimization steps on the fly, and uh, that just takes some time. Whereas WebAssembly tends to avoid all those problems and run at native speed or near native speed on the device and the platform. Uh, another great thing about it is it tends to be smaller than JavaScript. Um, those lines tend to cross each other. If it's a really tiny bit of, of JavaScript code or some other code you're doing in WebAssembly, the WebAssembly might actually be larger than trying to do it in JavaScript because there are some standard things WebAssembly needs to ship, like garbage collection, that you don't ship in JavaScript. But for anything of, of significant size, it tends to be smaller. And WebAssembly uh, gzips very well. Also, it, you can lose like 80% of your file size of WebAssembly through gzip uh, out of your web browser. So that's really cool too. Uh, another great thing about it is you can take libraries that aren't available in JavaScript or do things you can't do in JavaScript and compile them over to WebAssembly and run them there. So it could be some library that's been in C for 100 years that uh, you can compile to WebAssembly and run in a browser. So it's really neat stuff. Uh, the most popular language pe languages people seem to be using to create WebAssembly or compile to WebAssembly are Rust and C and C++. And those are great. Rust in particular, I had never messed with before I tried using it to compile some WebAssembly. And I can understand why it's so popular. It's like, uh, it, it's really good. Uh, but maybe you don't want to learn an entire new programming language. And Rust is a lot. There's a lot going on with Rust. Uh, you can make an entire operating system in Rust. And, which is which is a lot when you just want to you know have something yell hello world at you from WebAssembly. But there is this other way to do it, and it's called assembly script. Assembly script is uh, it's like a subset of TypeScript's syntax that and a compiler that will compile that over to WebAssembly. Now TypeScript, if you're not familiar with that it's um it's like javascript with a strong typing added on top in javascript uh, it's weak typing so a variable could be a string one minute and an integer the next minute and array the minute after that and you know you just don't know uh typescript adds strong typing to that so you know what something is when you see it that's good for avoiding certain kinds of errors um when you're writing code, especially where you're in a project where not everyone knows what's coming in and out of every function. Uh, it's, it's cool. Now, AssemblyScript is not TypeScript and does not use the TypeScript compiler. It just uses that syntax. So if you're familiar with JavaScript, or especially if you're familiar with TypeScript, AssemblyScript will look very familiar to you. And I thought we'd just do a quick hello world in assembly script so you can see how that works. So let's make a new folder, jump in there, and make this a node project. So let's install 
our, our dependencies. We're going to do, there's really only one thing you need. That's assembly script itself. But we're also going to put a helper on there. WebAssembly is loaded via JavaScript. So that, that's how you get WebAssembly into your, into your web page or into your project. There are a lot of different ways to do that. Um, the folks that made assembly script have written some, a couple of different helpers. There's as bind and there's uh, the assembly script loader. We'll just keep this simple and do the assembly script loader. Assembly script, I believe, yep, that's it. So now we just have basically a package.json and some node modules. Let's just do a boilerplate assembly script project. Go npx as init right here. And we'll just take the defaults. And now we have stuff. So let's take a closer look at that in VS Code. It's making an assembly folder, and that's where we put our assembly script. Um, and the file type for that is TypeScript, it's just .ts. And there'll be a TS config in here, which essentially tells the TypeScript compiler to look at this particular configuration because it's not all of TypeScript and there are some, some differences between them. But this will give us some, a lot of TypeScript's really cool, you know, on the fly error checking sort of stuff. Like it knows there's no such thing as a 31-bit integer. We wanted a 32 there. So this is the hello world uh, that it's giving us. It's just an add function. So you'd pass in two numbers and it'll re return the results. So we go down to our package.json and we have a couple scripts. We can build our assembly script. We'll go npm run as build. And in our build folder, that's going to make a, like a debug version and a production version of that web assembly for that function. So that's as easy as that was. Now we got web assembly that will do this addition function. So we've got a couple other things. Now, this index.js in the main folder is using the assembly script loader to load the assembly script into our project. Now, there are lots of different ways to do that. Uh, you can do that there's just vanilla JavaScript, um, but this is just handy, so we'll use this for now. So it is loading uh, our optimized WASM from our build folder and exporting that so uh, basically, another JavaScript can just import this and it will have our assembly script ready to go. Let's go over to our, it made a test and it's, it's pulling that assembly script in. You see it's setting that to my module. So it's going my module add one and two and it's expecting three as a result. So we can go npm run test and say okay because it got to our result. Happy day. Let's add another function to this. We'll just go export function and we'll just say subtract. Instead of A plus B, it'll be A minus B. We're making a calculator here. Yay is us. We'll build that again. And let's add another test to our script to make sure it's working. So let's do subtract. And we'll just do three minus two. And now we know that's one. Whenever you write a test, you make it fail first to make sure your test is actually testing something. It's gonna go, I wanted a one and you got a three. Or, I'm sorry, I wanted a three and you gave me a one. So we'll fix that. Now all our tests are good. So we have compiled WebAssembly that we can load into a JavaScript project and off way you go. Isn't that cool? Now the reason why I started learning WebAssembly is I wanted to convert some mathy kinds of things, some heavy lifting stuff that were being used by GLJS 1.3 or MapLibre and convert those to WebAssembly and see if I can get some benefits in terms of size of the wire and performance. One of the first things I looked at is one of the simplest uh, dependencies of those projects was was Mapbox's unit Bezier. So 
Unit Bezier is a JavaScript. It's a, a conversion JavaScript of this thing from WebKit. And it does Bezier stuff. I'm not even exactly sure what it does, but it does something. So the code looks like so. And I think the, what they're doing here, I believe the technical name of JavaScript is an object prototype where you declare a function, but it's kind of returning itself. You declare a function with some parameters and it kind of makes itself an object with some functions attached to it. Essentially, it's a different way to make a class, really, is the way I think of it. But I just converted this into a class. So instead of this function unit Bezier and doing some prototype stuff, which I don't think you can do in assembly shred, I'm making unit Bezier class, I'm doing some static typing for all the inputs and outputs. So this constructor is the equivalent of this initial function, and all these functions under the prototype are just functions as part of the class. So I did that. It ends up being about the same amount of code, about 80 lines. And he compiled that away, and after I got through a little few compilation errors, it works. I took the, the tests that are part of the, uh, the JavaScript unit Bezier, these different tests for the different functions, passing in numbers and see what it does. And I made those tests for the assembly script version. And everything works good. One, all these tests one through nine came out perfectly. I did some uh, benchmarking, but the problem is this JavaScript function, uh, this is so uh, so not heavy lifting and so small that it's really, like I'm running 10,000 solves <laughs> and it's the, the WebAssembly version does it in about three milliseconds and the JavaScript version does it in about four milliseconds in real life, you would never run this 10,000 times and you would never notice that difference. But it's a fairly straightforward thing. It, it, it was an easy thing to start on. So my, uh, when GLJS went proprietary, it, I mean, of course that was a bummer, but it also was like, hey, maybe it's time to start kicking around with GLJS 1.3 or MapLibre 1.4 and see what I can do with that. And one of my first thoughts was, there's a lot of math heavy lifting in really anything to do with WebGL, but uh, particularly what GLJS does. Well, if I start converting some of those heavy lifting portions to WebAssembly and see how that does, see how that affects performance. And I've been just dorking around with that kind of thing. And I'm just getting started with that. I took the uh, uh, the last open source version and I totally gutted it. I, I threw out all of Flow because Flow just makes me angry. It Flow Flow was a good decision when they made it because TypeScript really wasn't there when they started with Flow. But nowadays you'd use TypeScript for that kind of thing. So I tossed out Flow and and I tossed out some like the the special Mapbox uh, source handling and, and telemetry and and tossed out uh, a lot of the CSS really wasn't it, there were a lot of vendor flags in there that you just don't use anymore and I shaved like 15% off the size of the project and I really haven't done the web assembly stuff yet so I'm having fun playing with it I really don't think it's going to go anywhere but that's why I started as WebAssembly. Some things to note about WebAssembly is Internet Explorer 11 is a no-go. Hopefully at this point you do not care about Internet Explorer 11, but if you do, WebAssembly is, is not going to be a thing for you. Uh, another thing to think about is there are lots of different, I mean, this is compiled code, and if you know anything about compiled code, there's lots of different compiler options you can do. and yeah, they, they do different things. Like if you have some WebAssembly code that you're going to run once and then throw out, and then maybe sometime down the, later you can just reload it, run it once and throw it out, 
you can probably not care about garbage collection and you can tell the compiler just don't even include that because the garbage is not going to be a problem because you're throwing the whole library out. Lot, lots of things like that to optimize size and performance to look at. Another thing to look at is there are lots of different ways to load WebAssembly into your project. You could have one big WebAssembly file. You could have lots of little WebAssembly files. You could uh, you can even take WebAssembly and Base64 encode it as a string and plop it directly into your JavaScript. And then on the client side, Base64 decode it and run it as WebAssembly. The advantage of that is you're only shipping one file. You're just shipping your main JavaScript file. Uh, the disadvantage is the 64, Base64 encoded WebAssembly will probably be larger and there is some overhead to there'll be a little bit overhead to base 64 encode and decode that stuff uh, i for what i'm doing i think i'll end up with one big web assembly file because these are functions that are you'd have multiple files if you had functions that a user may never need so it wouldn't make any sense to load them unless they needed them uh, i would probably have one for this kind of project and then i would use you know http preload uh, or html preload for that so when the javascript requests it it's already there and you don't have that you know bump in your in your performance waterfall or having to request it fresh after it's gotten all the javascript and parsed it and started running it is probably how i'm going to do it but there there are lots of different things involved in WebAssembly. it's it's neat stuff and it is not as uh, especially using assembly script, it is not as hard as I thought it was going to be. And actually, with assembly script, it's learning the TypeScript as aspects of it, which I found challenging. Um, which, if you use type TypeScript before, which I know a lot of people have, uh, it'll just be a, a no-brainer. Anyway, I thought that was worth sharing. I uh, hope you found that interesting. And hopefully all of you are doing great. I hope wherever you are, the, uh, the numbers are coming down and going in the right direction and, and uh, things are looking up. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye.